next presenter is coming to us via Skype, and I think the technical bugs are all been ironed out. Uh, Dr. Roger Launius from the Smithsonian National Air and Space in Washington, D.C. Uh, Roger Launius is an Associate Director of Collections and Curatorial Affairs at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, Washington, D.C. Between 1990 and 2002, he served as the Chief Historian of NASA. He's a graduate of Graceland College in Lamoni, Iowa. He received his PhD from Louisiana State in Baton Rouge in 1982. And he worked as a civilian historian with the United States Air Force until 1990. He's written or edited more than 20 books on aerospace history, has received the AIAA History's Manuscript Prize, and many others. Uh, Dr. Launius. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be with you today. I hope everybody can hear me okay over the Skype connection. Uh, what I wanted to talk about is historical analogies in lunar commercialization. It's a subject I've been working on. All of the examples I'm going to use are US-centric. I apologize for that, but that's my particular area of expertise, and so that's what we're going to focus on. I've got four little analogies I want to relate to you today. Uh, the first one is Transcontinental Railroad in the United States. And I would suggest that is there a lunar transportation corridor that could result in much the same way? And, well, perhaps, with modifications. Uh, in the 1850s in the U.S., uh, the Congress decided to pursue a transcontinental railroad. But they didn't want to build it themselves. They didn't want to operate it. They thought it should be a private sector activity. So they uh, enticed uh, entrepreneurs to build the railroads, giving them all kinds of advantages from the standpoint of tax relief, uh, direct uh, subsidies, as well as land grants that uh, enabled them to build a railroad essentially from the Midwest, uh, from the Chicago area out to San Francisco. And uh, it was a major success, uh, and in 1869 it was realized uh, in the U.S. Uh, it was a public-private partnership in, in uh, the best sense of the term, I think. Uh, the Pacific Railroad Act in 1862 provided uh, the, the model for how they were going to do this. It granted uh, huge tracts of land on various sides of the railway tract uh, that the railroads could then develop, sell, do with whatever they saw fit. Uh, they could also use that as collateral for private loans in addition to government subsidies that uh, were made available to them through the form of bonds and, and direct subsidies that did not have to be paid back. Uh, they were to repay whatever bonds were issued and things of this nature through revenues, uh, but much of that actually did not take place. Uh, many of the initial railroads that were constructed went bankrupt and went into receivership and had to be restructured, and uh, the government forgave the debt. Um, the reality is that uh, the system worked, but only with a sizable governmental, both at the national level and the state and local levels, uh, investment. It did succeed in creating a, a, a transcontinental railroad system, however. So the question is, can that sort of analogy be transferred to space transportation? And uh, are there aspects of it that we might try to, um, uh, to pursue? One of those is private financing and government loans, uh, and maybe outright subsidies as a, uh, in addition to that. Uh, another is uh, property and patent rights could be granted to participating firms. What form that might take is anybody's guess, but that's another possibility. And then, of course, revenues that would result. Uh, presumably, the firms that would undertake this work would be uh, contracted with by the government uh, as well as others to move goods, individuals, uh, and so forth to other locations. Who knows if this might be possible, especially uh, in context of some transportation corridor between the Earth and the Moon. Clearly there's no land to grant. Uh, could something be done in the context of, of the Moon itself? Uh, there are obviously restrictions on ownership of, uh, of land on the moon, but maybe that can be changed. We'll have to see. And the patents may not be sufficient to do much of anything in terms of spurring development. 
it's a it's a problematic issue but something to think about my second model is also about transportation and it's a model that's very much built around the commercial aviation industry in the United States uh, initially the government sought a monopoly uh, for all transportation services in the United States there were people who wanted to uh, uh, to engage in this themselves, but uh, much of the commercial making activity, much of the money making activity associated with this was uh, limited to government operations at that point, either military in, direct, uh, in a direct sense or uh, flying the airmail or doing various things like this. It was a, a government entity. Um, the U.S. Congress got into the act and sought to change that very quickly. And uh, they saw the need for federal involvement in this from that, from, in terms of national security, in terms of fostering economic, economic competitiveness, and in the whole issue of pride and prestige. And this was a big deal in the first decade after the Wright brothers first flew their airplane in 1903. Uh, within a decade, all of the technological developments had moved offshore and Europe was leading the world. Uh, in, uh, in aviation technology, and the Americans were left in the dust. So there was an effort to invest significant amounts of federal dollars to try to end that. It took a variety of forms. Um, one of those was direct national security military uh, investments in both the development of technology, the purchase of aircraft, and uh, the development of landing fields and, and support structures to make it possible to fly. Research and development became a, a critical component in all of this, and the U.S. government created uh, the predecessor to NASA in 1915, uh, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, that was directed to undertake research and development, leading specifically to more efficient, uh, more viable aircraft capabilities. They also put in place a, a regulatory environment and they tried to foster commercial development by uh, forcing the merger of small uh, one, two airplane firms into larger firms and by 1930 had created the kinds of airlines that you see today. And so uh, big, airplane, big airlines uh, in the United States like American Airlines and United Airlines uh, emerged out of that 1930 merger effort. Um, there are also efforts associated with building the infrastructure to support them and New York and New Jersey combined to create a port authority which not only dealt with the port of New York but also with the building and operation of the airports around New York. So LaGuardia Airport and later on uh, Kennedy International, uh, the Newark International Airport were all under this particular uh, area of responsibility. There were direct government subsidies to the U.S. air carriers until 1966. So this be did not become a self-supporting initiative until well after the fact. Um, there are some who would still say that it's not terribly self-supporting and it's a sporty game in terms of maintaining capabilities in uh, any sort of aviation endeavor. But government investment created what exists today. Um, this is a slide that shows the major acts of Congress between 1925 and 1938. There's three of them. One is the Airmail Act which directed that the post office contract for its services with outside carriers and not have its in not have its own in-house air force which it had up until that point the commerce act which was really built around creating the infrastructure to support aviation and then the civil aeronautics act in 1938 which put in place the regulatory envi environment the licensing of pilots the certification of aircraft and the broader uh, aspects associated with the aviation industry um, it is an imperfect at best uh, analogy, but one that suggests that with significant government investment, a lot can be done. Uh, and I would suggest to you that that is sort of the direction that NASA is heading today uh, with, its, uh, with its efforts to sponsor commercial space operations only in low Earth orbit, not, not going to the moon as yet, 
but, uh, but in the context of orbital activities. And the, the firms that are engaged in developing new launch vehicles, uh, new like capsules and carriers for both astronauts and cargo to the International Space Station are the recipient of a, of a very similar approach to what we saw with the aviation industry. Uh, can we really build a commercial space line industry? Uh, your, your guess is as good as mine. Um, let me talk about two other things relative to the, to the moon very quickly. The, um, the possibility of a lunar base. Uh, my model for this has always been McMurdo Station in Antarctica. Uh, it is largely, in fact, almost entirely, uh, a government activity. It is paid for by the National uh, Science Foundation in the U.S. Uh, it cycles scientists and support people in and out of there. It emerged in the 1950s as a part of the International Geophysical Year efforts at the poles. Uh, it is overseen by a UN international consortium that manages uh, Antarctica through the Antarctic Treaty System. And uh, it is contracted out but the funds for that contracting are under uh, the auspices of the U.S. government. And there has been virtually no commercial activities associated with this. There is a bit of, of tourism that uh, is being engaged in in Antarctica. Um, there are some uh, researchers who have suggested that if the NSF were allowed to do so, it could create its own tourism industry to McMurdo Station and pay for the rest of the operations associated with uh, the American efforts there. Whether or not that's true, that's one model that has been pursued. Uh, it, it's unlikely that the Antarctic Treaty System will allow this to take place, but it is something that is being actively discussed. So could we have a McMurdo station on the moon? Could we have something that was developed and funded by government entities, operated by private sector firms, perhaps with the capability to expand operations for purely commercial activities, either from a mining standpoint or especially from a tourism standpoint. Uh, all of those are open questions. It's conceivable that it is possible. And then the last thing I want to talk about is uh, tourism. Uh, I already mentioned that in the context of, of, a, uh, of a lunar base. The national park experience in the United States is interesting here. In 1916, the U.S. government created the national park system and uh, established the first national parks, many of them in very remote locations in the United States, far away from anything. Uh, but there were a couple of options that they could have taken. They could have treated this as uh, wildlife refuge and, uh, and natural habitat and done nothing to try to develop it. Or they could try overwhelmingly to develop it and turning it, turn it into a, a major sort of um, a place where people would live, work, and so forth. They chose a, a third course, which was basically to um, try to keep it in a preserved form as much as possible, but encourage firms private sector firms to build and maintain the transportation systems, the uh, hotels, the restaurants, the various things that were necessary to support tourists who would visit these sites. That's been enormously successful. And, uh, uh, and some of the activities, if any of you have been to such places as the Grand Canyon, uh, you will see the vestiges of those early concessionaire uh, hotels, uh, restaurants, and so forth that exist there. And uh, it, it really charted a third way in terms of trying to deal with tourism and making it something that was attractive and possible for people to get to. Could we do the same sort of thing with, with a lunar base? Uh, it's an interesting question. The answer is unknown. Uh, NASA is, is working toward leasing more and more services through contracts. Uh, it's conceivable that something like that might be possible on the moon as well. Outposts could conceivably be privately owned, uh, operating under NASA or maybe an international consortium's um, uh, rules, but, uh, but 
eventually, after some time of support, standing on their own and operating as a commercial entity. All of those are possibilities. None of them are certainties. Many of them are hard to do, and I see my time is up. So thank you very much. Can we do these things? Obviously, we certainly can. Uh, I would encourage creative thinking in these areas. Thank you. Thank you to Dr. Lonius. It was a very interesting uh, presentation. He's gone already, so there we go. <laughs>